let's measure the speed of the wave on this slinky three different ways. When you do this at home, make sure the end of your slinky is fixed. I've looped my end of the slinky through this lock at the door. Then you're going to have to measure the length of the slinky. I've used a tape measure, which is following the curve of the slinky. So we get about 128 inches. You can convert that to the metric system. But when you do this lab at home, you should be using five meters. Of course, the simplest way to measure the speed is just to time it over the distance. The second easy way to measure this velocity is to use a standing wave pattern. Here we have one full standing wave. You should be able to find the velocity from the frequency and the wavelength. And the last method to find the velocity is theoretical. We'll use the tension found from the spring sail hooked up to the end of the slinky. I just have it hooked on the end of the slinky. You can get a reading right here. Now, when you do this at home, you have to make sure the slinky is not coiled up such that it makes the shaft rotate and then it binds up and it sticks. You want to make sure this thing is moving freely. And then we have to get the mass of the slinky. So we're finding the speed of a transverse wave on a slinky. We've got three different ways. The easiest is the direct measurement. Velocity is distance over time. Keep track of how many times the wave went back and forth. Method two was a standing wave pattern. Just use velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Well, part three is the heart of this experiment. We need to find the velocity from the tension, the mass, and the length. And that's going to require some explaining. Here I have the slinky, and I shake my hand up and down real quick and send a pulse down the slinky. Well, there has to be a tension force of me pulling this back, or else the whole thing will just collapse. We learned earlier that the tension will affect the speed of the wave. How come? Let's take a look at a small portion of the slinky at the very top of the wave. The tension is pulling at an angle. The Y components of these tensions are going to snap the wave back to the equilibrium position. That explains the more we stretch out the slinky, the bigger the tension, the quicker it'll snap back, and that's going to increase the velocity. Now consider the effect of the mass. The mass of this little portion is going to have inertia. It's going to resist this change in motion. So the bigger the mass, the harder it is for it to move, the slower the wave ought to go. So let's say we know the mass of the entire slinky, and we know the length of the slinky all stretched out. This ratio is called the linear mass density, and we're going to use that to figure out how much mass we have at the top of the wave. Now to derive a formula. We can say that the wave is moving to the right at velocity v, or we can change our frame of reference and imagine that this is just staying still, and the rope is being pulled over the hump at velocity v. That's like saying the mass at the top of the wave is moving to the left at velocity v, and it's following this curve. Well, at the top of the curve, we can approximate this to be a section of a circle of radius r. It's not circular all the way around. It's only circular across the top. We can assume this section is mass m. And if it's moving in a circle, there must be a centripetal force. Well, what could cause that centripetal force? Take a look at the tension in the slinky pulling on this mass. Those two Y components would produce the centripetal force. So we can say that the FC is caused by two of these Y components. We know that the FC has got to be MV squared over R. And TY can be found by taking the Y component of this tension, which means taking the sine of this angle. So where is that angle? It's the same as this angle, which is the same as that angle. And we have the same thing on the other side. So we have 2t sine theta equals mv squared over r. 
Well, we can measure the tension. We did that with the spring scale. But now we have to tackle the mass, the radius, and that angle. Let's call this arc length S. We'll use the linear mass density. If the density is constant, then we can say that the mass of the slinky at the top divided by the arc length is the same ratio. We can now eliminate m. If we know the linear mass density, we can multiply by the arc length. Well, great, what's the arc length? Take a look at the diagram. It's gonna be equal to r times two theta, as long as we measure it at the angle in radians. It's looking a little complicated, but it's gonna simplify. The radius just canceled. The two just canceled. And now I'm gonna cancel theta with sine theta. I know you don't like this, but remember, it works for a small angle approximation. And that's valid because we're only talking about the top of this curve. This is what we're left with. Solving for V, we have the square root of the tension divided by the linear mass density. The tension, remember, was found from the spring scale. The linear mass density, get the mass of the slinky that was on the digital balance and divide by the length of the stretch slinky. That's in the video. So we should be able to test this and see if this number works out to be anything like these. Whenever we derive a new formula, we should ask ourselves, does it make any sense? If the tension is increased, that number gets bigger, that gets bigger. Does that work? If we pull tighter, the Y components get bigger and this will snap down quicker. If we have more mass, it's more inertia, and that should make this thing slower. Bigger mass, harder for it to come down. 